Dr. Boyer, it looks like uh, 1.1C. Yes. 1.1 is long. It is, but there's, there's so much history yeah, to astronomy. Yeah, there's C, and we still have D to go. We're talking about backyard astronomy. Exactly. A lot of stuff in this 1.1 section, guys. So today we want to learn about uh, prehistoric astronomy, how the Earth moves, and some, some of the interesting things about how the Earth moves. So let's, let's just dive right in. Um, today we want to talk about the seasons. Yes. Now, you guys understand there's seasons, winter and summer and all that stuff, but there's some misconceptions about why the seasons occur. And so to kind of illustrate that, let me draw a picture of the sun. So that's the sun. Should be yellow. I'm going to be yellow. Oh well. That's the sun. And here's the earth. And the earth, of course, revolves around the sun in an ellipse. Exactly. So it goes in an ellipse. Um, so here's the misconception a lot of people think. In an ellipse, there are times when the earth is further away, sometimes the earth's over here, than it is, let's say the shorter line is red. And so a lot of people would think that of course this over here would be the summer because you're closer to the sun, and then this would be the winter because you're further away from the sun. Well that makes sense. It makes sense, and yeah. a lot of people would think that's true, but Wrong. It's not true. It's not true at all. The Earth's orbit, though it is an ellipse, is very, very close to a circle. So this has no effect on the seasons. Seasons are caused by something else. So this is wrong. wrong. So don't get confused when you're trying to uh, answer a question about why do we have the seasons. Okay? There's a second misconception that a lot of people don't understand. And this has to do with the uh, tilt of the Earth. Now, the Earth is tilted, and the tilt of the Earth, the tilt of the Earth is what causes the seasons, but there's a misconception about how it causes the seasons. The Earth, by the way, is tilted at about 23 degrees. Is it 23 and a half? 23 and a half, right 20, now. 23 and a half. Um, and so it's tilted at 23 and a half, and so if you have um, the sun, okay, here's the sun now. A lot of people think, of course, is that um, you probably realize that if it's pictured this way, this is actually the uh, the northern hemisphere's summer, the way I've drawn this, right? And so some people would say, well, the rays of the sun are, the, it's closer to the earth right? Um, uh, in the northern hemisphere. And if I were to draw this line, this would be farther. That's right. And that seems logical as well. It does, but it's wrong but again. But it's wrong. That is not why we have seasons. No. Um, it does have to do with the tilt of the Earth, but it's not because of this. Okay, so we've been talking about what doesn't cause the seasons. We should probably talk about what does. What does. Now, a, a much better picture than I was able to draw there. Understand that the seasons are related to the tilt of the Earth. You may want to, by the way, folks, copy this picture down, or frankly, if you're like in a quick time or something, you can say file print, put it in your notes. Um, to kind of get an idea, there are four important points to understand. There's the uh, autumnal equinox. What does that mean, autumnal equinox? Oh, that's the first day of autumn. Okay, so... And equinox means that you have equal amounts of daylight and nighttime hours. Okay, good. And that's true also of the, the spring equinox, exactly. or the vernal equinox equal to hours of light, light and darkness. So exactly. 12 hours and 12 hours. So everywhere That's on right. the earth there's 12 hours of sunlight and 12 hours of darkness. That's right. All right. On the equator pretty much that's the way they live all the time, but here of course in the northern hemisphere, of course in the summer we have longer days and shorter nights. In the winter the reverse. And of course now summer solstice, this is the longest day of the year yep. in before at least for the northern hemisphere as is pictured here, is that you would have the most sunshine That's right. and the least That's darkness. Right. Yep. And then conversely, the winter solstice, which we recently passed here, yep. um, it's mostly dark. Yep. And this is related to the tilt of the earth. Exactly. Okay. Now, how is it related to the tilt of the earth? I think to help us understand how the tilt of the wor earth works, let's do a quick video clip. All right. So here's our sun, nice beach ball, and here's the earth, and we've got the earth tilted at about 23 and a half degrees. And of course, the earth makes an ellipse around the sun, but very close to a circle. 
So we can imagine that as the Earth goes around the Sun, that the angle that the Earth makes with its axis with respect to the Sun is going to change. And that, of course, is what determines the seasons. Now, let's just look at each of those special times of the year when we have a solstice or an equinox. So when the Earth's axis is tilted towards the sun, then in the northern hemisphere, we have our summer. And that's because the rays of the sun are most intense in the northern hemisphere at this point. And then as the Earth moves around the sun for three months, then the axis of the Earth is no longer pointed towards the sun or away from the sun. The axis is parallel, and this is called an equinox. This is when we have equal amounts of daylight and nighttime hours. And then as we go three more months, then now the axis of the Earth is tilted away from the sun for the northern hemisphere, we get less heating from the sun, so we have our winter. And then as we move another three months around, then the axis of the Earth is now parallel to the sun, and we have our next equinox, equal amounts of nighttime and daytime hours. And so this procession every three months of the Earth's axis with respect to the sun gives us the beginning of each of our seasons. And so, this would be spring, summer, fall, winter, and then we repeat the cycle again indefinitely. So when we have an equinox, just remember that the axis of the Earth is parallel to the axis of the sun right here, so that this axis neither points towards nor away from the sun. That's the equinox. But when we have the axis pointed away from the sun, we have winter, and then parallel again for spring, and then pointed towards the sun, we have our summer again. And that's how the seasons work. Now, of course, if you're in the southern hemisphere, it's the exact opposite. Because while we're having summer right here, they're not getting maximum heating from the sun in the southern hemisphere, and they have their winter. And that's the way the seasons work. So, Dr. Boyer, you're saying that the Earth, it's got this tilt. Yes, indeed. But it doesn't, like, change its tilt. No. So when it comes here, it's not like here because it's kind of rotate, you know, does the, it's just staying the same with respect to the sun. But, you know, if it's this way, there's the sun now. And then now you're here, it keeps the same angle. And how would I draw that? It's going to be, well, it's hard to do it in two dimensions. Anyways, I'm not doing a very good job, but it doesn't change. It was easier That's right. watching the model as you walked around the room. Exactly. It I think. helps to see it with a glow. Yeah, yeah. All right, so the seasons, we explained seasons, guys. I yeah. think I think you're starting to understand seasons. Hopefully you do. If not, make sure you ask oh. questions in class. Now, the nice thing picture. that we haven't talked about is why is there a variation in temperature? All these misconceptions, yep. but we really haven't explained that to them. No, we haven't, and there it is. This picture will probably help us figure that out. So here's the deal, guys. The, the, red, the sun's rays, they come in, um, of course, um, they come in straight, right? But the Earth is tilted. Exactly. And so if you are in the northern hemisphere, and if I were to draw lines of, let's say, equal um, distance apart of rays, you can kind of see that picture, okay? And that's, this is the summer for the people who live in the north. But if I drew two lines here in the southern hemisphere, okay, that they're the same distance apart, I'll attempt to do that. Ah, and then, difference. if you look at the Earth, Look right here. How much of the Earth is getting the same amount of energy as is down here? You see, down here, if I were to measure that in square miles, let's say that this is a thousand square miles of Earth getting this much energy. That's right. And down here, I don't know, you, hopefully you can see that I've drawn a line down here. This red line here is maybe double the size, yeah, or exactly a time right. and a half, or whatever. This might be let's say 2,000 square miles. That's probably an overstatement, but ah. but if you're getting a larger space with the same amount of energy as a smaller space, the smaller space would be warmer, wouldn't it? Exactly. It's and so this will be hot because the, a smaller space is getting the same amount of energy as a larger space right. down here. So the southern hemisphere is going to be cold. So be cold. 
and this will be hot. Exactly. Yeah. And there's your different seasons. That's why we have seasons. It's related to the tilt of the Earth, but it has to do with how much energy is hitting um, the Earth. I mean, it's the Earth is tilted and also spherical, so that makes the difference. So that's what causes the seasons, folks. That's exactly. no misconceptions here. Mm -hmm. This is what explains the seasons. Expect a cool essay question, I'm sure, on a test somewhere. Yeah. All right. So I have that. Twice. Oh, this is the winter. And picture. here's winter. So yeah, I think we, we explained that in the last slide. I think we don't need to go on with that. All right. Ah, here we go. Nice picture. This this is the picture that we were attempting to do with our globe. Hopefully you can kind of see they keep the right tilt, etc., to help us Just understand. Notice the tilt of the Earth is always in the same direction, no matter where it is as it goes around the sun. Yeah. So this tilt right here uh, uh, yep. is the same as this tilt. But one of them, of course, is going to be winter, and one of them is going to be summer. Exactly. Okay. And these, this one here, and this one. Oops, what did I just do? I know I did. And this one here, and this one here, of course, are our equinoxes. Are our, uh, yes, the equinoxes. The equinoxes. I said exactly that. Exactly right. right. Yes, that right. Okay. All right. And we've seen this picture. There's this thing called the ecliptic, right? Yeah. And this is how the sun moves. This was in our last podcast. And um, th the sun moves along this pattern right here, right? This little deal right here. And of course, where do we find the equinoxes? Where are those at, Dr. Boyer? Ah, the equinoxes are where the celestial equator and the ecliptic touch right here. So that, that's, an, that's an equinox. The equinox, and then you see it happens over here. Okay, yeah. And this point is the same point over here. So you okay. can imagine this is a strip that's wrapped around on itself, okay. and the pattern repeats itself every year. All right, and then our solstices are here and here. Exactly. When so June, at least for the northern hemisphere, this would be the um, summer equinox, and this would be the winter, winter solstice. Equinox. Or one winter solstice. solstice. Thank you. I said the wrong word. So this is where um, it reaches its highest or its lowest, lowest point, point in, in the, the horizon. Okay, so that's how the ecliptic relates to the solstices and the equinoxes. Okay, all right, and this is another picture that might help illustrate. Is of course the ecliptic is this green line you can kind of see right here. Yep. And then we've got the celestial equator right here. And so when we get to this spot right here, where there is an intersection between the celestial equator and the, and the uh, ecliptic, that's when you get an equinox. And of course, you get the other one would be right here. And once you're at the highest point, you get the summer solstice, and, and the lowest point, the winter. Yes. winter solstice. So this helpfully illustrates also how the solstices and the equinoxes um, work together. All right. uh, well, now we should talk about the zodiac, and you probably, you know, some people read their horoscope. I'm not into that. Don't think it's a big deal. But um, there is something that relates to this. So let's just kind of give you a little lesson on how the zodiac works. Now, if you look up in the sky, you've probably heard there's Capricorn, you know, there's Aquarius and Pisces, and you probably know what sign you're born under your birth or whatever it is. Um, turns out that there's lots of constellations in the skies. Okay, there's like the Big Dipper, and there is um, Orion. We talked about that the last time. But some of those are not in the Zodiac. Nope. Because the Zodiac are the constellations that appear on the ecliptic. So if you look at the ecliptic here, that's this tan line that goes through here. This ecliptic right here is, so if you look up at the sky, you see Virgo appears at a certain time of the year, but it follows the ecliptic. There's, you know, a constellation maybe down here, I don't know what it would be, but you could figure out what that is. But this right here, it's the zodiac are the constellations that appear along the ecliptic. And so there are 12 of them. And there are 12 of them. And so that's how you get the 12 signs of the zodiac during the year. Right. Now, as a side note, to understand how this works, and an interesting thing that I always thought was kind of odd, is that if you are like born under the sign of Aquarius, and if you look up at the sky during, um, which is around February, right. um, and you know what you'd find? You wouldn't see Aquarius. No, because the sun would block your view. It would be, Aquarius would be up during the daytime, and yeah. you can't see it. So that's kind of odd. What does that mean? Not well, really. it has to do with the fact that for people who believe in the zodiac and the signs, it's when the sun passes through that constellation right. as seen from the Earth. That's so, the yeah. So when the sun, so it, it, even though it might be February, you can't see the Aquarius until it's like September, the opposite time of the year. 
so that's kind of odd, I think. But well, that's the way they defined that's it. That's the way they defined it. It's it's arbitrary. It's not whatever. So what about planets? Oh, I love the planets. Planets are different. You know, and we alluded to the last time that the planets do something kind of odd. And well, what's the odd thing that they do? They do something called retrograde motion. What in the world is retrograde motion? Now think about this. Retro grade. It's retro means. Retro means backwards. Yeah, so it's like if it's like it's retro days at the high school. Yep. It means go back and dress in the 1950 styles. There go we back go. Back to the 50s. Back to the 50s. Or yes. whatever, right? So that means that the planets, remember we said that the um, the stars and whatnot in the sky travel from the east to the west, if you look, right. up the at, at, at the sky. They move. Um, night, nightly, left to right. And that's also true, they move left to right yearly. So at one time of the year it's here, and then a few, a month later, the, a particular star will be here. Right. At this, let's say we always start at 9 p.m. at night. Sure. So you look at the sky at 9 p.m., um, this star is here on, let's say, um, uh, February 1. And then if we go to uh, March, March 1st, on March 1st, that uh, you would see that same star here. Exactly. And, and they just follow the same progression. But planets, they're different. Break the rules. Yes. So what do they do? They, they move backwards. Retrograde motion means they move backwards. So let's take a look at this animation on the internet. Take a look down here. This is the path of Mars. I, I went the wrong direction tonight. And look what he's starting to do now. He's going backwards. Oh my gosh. And now he changed directions again. And then he changes directions again. So I, I had my well, my picture backwards, didn't I? Mr. Well, Mr. actually, Mr. it all depends upon your point of view, whether you're looking at it from the surface of the Earth or you're off the surface of the Earth looking at the celestial sphere. Oh. So this picture here is though you're not on the surface of the Earth. Oh, then I was right. Okay, you were right. Okay, yeah. I, I was taking the perspective. So let's watch that again, guys, and watch this planet as it moves across. Yep. This is Mars. Mars. And then, this is over the course of a year, right? Um, and boom, he moves backwards. The only things that move backwards are, are the planets. planets. In fact, that's how they got their name. The planets yeah. comes from the Greek meaning wanderer. Yeah. And the Mars is wandering across the sky, contrary to the motion of the stars. So this confused the early astronomers. Nobody had a good explanation for why this happened. It actually led to huge historical stuff, which we'll talk about later. Um, in our uh, later podcast. But let's talk about why it happens. Uh, well, of course, the Earth, this picture kind of really is, here, of course, is the sun right here. And then we've got uh, the Earth. There's the Earth in blue. Earth is blue and Mars, Mars is, is red. red, of course. And so if you were standing on the Earth and you were trying to look at Mars um, on a given time of the day, or a time of the year, I should say, you would see Mars here in position one. Yep. But then the Earth rotates faster than Mars does. Exactly. Because it's shorter, it's shorter a smaller yeah. orbit. And then this uh, travels slower. And so at, at point two, so a few months later, a month later, something like that, uh, if Mars is here, well then it's gonna appear to move to here, which is fine. But if you realize, then you go to point three, it's now going backwards. Yes. And point four. So from your perspective, it follows this pattern. I'll highlight it in blue. This is the retrograde yes. motion. It simply means the Earth is passing Mars, and that's how you yeah. get that effect. It's like a race, and as it and the race, and yeah, Mars yep. loses, and the Earth passes. It's 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 like lapping Mars. Exactly. You know, if you're thinking about it from a that's track right. perspective, Mars takes two years, and Earth only one. So, yeah. Yep. So that's what causes retrograde motion. It's really quite that simple. All right. A couple more things to talk about. The moon. The oh. moon is cool. Yes. The moon does some weird things, doesn't it? It does. Okay. So, the moon has uh, phases. Yep. First of all, the moon revolves around the Earth, right? So, it takes a month to do that. It does. A little less than a month. Yeah, 28 days, I think it is. So, the, uh, it goes around and around, and then there's different phases of the moon. You guys know this. There's full moons, oh, yeah. and crescent moons, and gibbous moons, and all that kind of crescent moons, all that kind of stuff. So, how come? Well, it has to do with the position of the moon with respect to the Earth and the sun. So when you see this, the moon, what you're actually seeing is the reflection of the light from the sun yep. on the moon. 
So um, keep that in mind. I think this next picture helps illustrate it the best. So to kind of understand the phases of the moon. So I think this second picture, Dr. Boer, illustrates this pretty well. It exactly. explains how the moon works and right. how the phases of the moon works. And so I think to understand this, we need to understand that the sun is up here on the top. Exactly. Right? And so in a new moon, the sun's rays hit the moon, but they hit the backside of the moon. You can't see it. And therefore, what do you see? Nothing. Nothing. It's a new moon. Kind of weird. It is. There's no moon. Just disappeared. It just totally disappeared. Now, if the sun is up here in picture number two, and when it hits the, the moon, it just is going to highlight just a very, very small amount of it because most of it's in the shadow. Exactly. And that, of course, creates the crescent, crescent. moon. When the, when the sun's up here and it hits the moon, actually, you might kind of hit it here. You kind of see it's going to cut it in half, and then you can see a half a moon. That's right. Which is called the first quarter. Right. The waxing gibbous, the, 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 moon's, or the sun's still up here, and it's going to highlight most of the moon. And it create, you know, maybe kind of like that. I'm trying to, you know, it's going to be that much of the moon. That's right. I'm trying to draw. And waxing it. means to increase. Yeah, the word waxing. Yeah, the word waxing means to increase. Waxing, like you wax the floor and to make it brighter. You're adding. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then a full moon. The sun's here. You might think, oh, wait a second, the, the Earth's in the way, but not really. And it's going to, you're going to be able to see all of the moon, and so that is completely visible. That's the full, full moon. moon. Yeah, it's a full moon. In fact, I think today it was a full moon. Yes, I'm very close. Yes. And then, of course, the, this waning gibbous is the same thing. It's getting smaller. Waning means getting smaller. It's starting to, to shrink. Yep. Less and then light. the last quarter, and then the crescent. And then we get a new moon again. Same, and then same we process. Go. And then we do it over and over and over again. Okay? A couple more things we want to talk about uh, to talk about here is there's things called eclipses. There's oh. a solar eclipse, and there is a lunar eclipse. Now, to understand a solar eclipse, what's going on? It's, I, I just think it's sun, moon, earth. Yep. You get the sun. You get the moon and then the earth. That is a solar eclipse. Pretty simple. Just so happens that the moon's at exactly the right distance from the earth so that it almost completely covers the yeah. sun. Yeah. yeah, that is amazing. It's it is. just perfect like that. Exactly. Um, that is. Wasn't always that way. Oh, uh, we should talk about that. Well, some of the time. All right, lunar eclipse, ah. sun, earth, moon. There we go. There's the moon right there. Moving into the Earth's shadow, right? Sun, Earth, Moon, and so you get what's called the lunar eclipse. And what's neat is the fact that this doesn't completely disappear. It has a nice reddish glow because the sunlight goes through the Earth's atmosphere and bends. still bends, and it still gives you light on the moons. Yeah, we just had one of those just a few. Uh about weeks. last few weeks ago, exactly. Um, here is a, a picture of a lunar eclipse over time, and I, I got up in the middle of the night to watch this. I did too. It's One o'clock in the morning, yeah. and I was looking at it. And you know, it kind of looks as this. This is the classic uh, sort of blood red picture when it's reached uh, perfection, so to speak. Or what's the actual word that when it's complete? It's in totality. In totality. I knew there was a word. And here's a. I think here's a picture of all of it. There's, there there's, there's not nice. quite totality because we've got this little sliver Just down here, a little bit. but we're close. You can kind of see that sort of blood red color. It's really quite, quite cool. And this is a really important event because this was what was used by the Greeks to prove that the Earth was a sphere. Oh. Yes. So this is a really important and I think event. we're going to talk about that in you chapter... Bet we something later. Just a little bit later. And we should just have one last conversation. A lot of people should say, well, you know, since why don't we have an eclipse then every month? Because, yeah. uh, you know, every new moon should produce a um, solar, eclipse, solar eclipse. And every, yeah. every uh, full, uh, moon. full moon should produce. But it turns out that the lunar orbit and the Earth orbit are not in the same plane. No, they are not. So the moon travels around the Earth at this angle, and if you kind of see this, is a different whole plane. That's right. But occasionally they intersect. And so you can see them intersecting here and um, here. Right there. And so if you get a day where you get a full moon or a uh, new moon, when it's intersecting the, the orbits intersect, the, the orbits intersect, that's when you have a chance. That, that, well, that not just, is it a chance? You will have one. It doesn't happen in every part of the that's world. That's right. It depends upon where you are on the surface of the Earth to see the solar eclipse, but everybody can see the lunar eclipse for the uh, most part. Because, yeah, the, the solar eclipse, the shadow changes. It changes. It's very small shadow on the Earth from the solar eclipse. But so your chances of seeing a solar eclipse are very low. Very low. The chance of a lunar eclipse is quite high. Very good, yes. 
So you see. might only see one solar eclipse in your lifetime, but you'll see many lunar eclipses in your lifetime. In fact, we have another one coming up in Colorado in another 15 months or so. Okay, yeah, so we had one a couple a month ago, and now we got, so yeah, every, every, every 16 months? Roughly, yep. But solar eclipses, much, much rarer. Much rarer. Okay, well folks, that uh, ends this podcast. We'll see you in class. Right.